comments and opinions expressed on Writers in Focus are those of the individual participants and are presented for the purpose of discussion only. No endorsements by Atlanta Fulton Public Library System or Fulton County Government are intended and none should be presumed. Hi, welcome to Writers in Focus. I'm your host, James Taylor, and today I'm delighted to have as my guest. Okay. Good, good. No, I wasn't. Yeah. Okay. Comments and opinions expressed on Writers in Focus are those of the individual participants and are presented for the purpose of discussion only. No endorsements by Atlanta Fulton Public Library System or Fulton County Government are intended and none should be presumed. Welcome to Writers in Focus. I'm your host, James Taylor, and today I'm delighted to have as my guest, Thomas Mullen. May I call you Thomas? Sure. I'd like to welcome you to the Fulton County Government Center and the Atlanta Fulton Public Library. By way of introduction, ladies and gentlemen, Thomas Mullen is the author of three novels. His first book, The Last Town on Earth, won the USA Today Debut Fiction Award and the James Fenimore Cooper Prize for Best American Historical Fiction. Past winners have included John Edgar Wideman, Philip Roth, and Peter Matheson. Amazing company to have. Your second novel, Thomas, published in 2010, won the prestigious 2012 Townsend Award for Fiction. It sounds weird, but it really did. The 2012 Townsend Award for Fiction uh, awarded every two years for the best work of fiction by a Georgia author. Past winners have included Ha Jin, Alice Walker, and Feral Sams. You're in good company. Uh, this is the novel that we're going to talk about, The Many Deaths of the Firefly Brothers. Your latest novel, uh, The Revisionist, came out last year, but we're going to ignore that until it sure. wins a couple of prizes. Okay. Um, I heard about you from winning the Townsend Prize. I immediately said, I've got to read this novel, The Many Deaths of the Firefly Brothers, and I'm going to put my cards on the table. I've interviewed hundreds of authors over the years. You're one of the best novelists I've ever encountered. How have you remained so fine a writer, so much of a recipient of awards, and yet you're not famous yet? I or guess, is it just me? I guess my publicists aren't doing their <laughs> job. I don't know. I don't know, but I'm, I'm glad you liked the book. Oh, yeah, yeah. It, uh, it, it knocked me out. It's, I want you to do most of the talking, but um, I'm going to quote uh, a New York Times book reviewer. Uh, quote, it takes guts for a, for a writer to give away his novel's fundamental conceit in the title itself, The Many Deaths of the Firefly Brothers. Two questions. What do you mean by many deaths and who are the Firefly Brothers? Well, the Firefly Brothers are two brothers in 1930s Ohio. They're two of three brothers. Their last name is Fireson and they get nicknamed the Firefly Brothers. They're famous bank robbers. This is the era of John Dillinger, Bonnie and Clyde, Pretty Boy Floyd. All these are larger than life criminals. And they really robbed hundreds of banks between them all across state lines. Um, they were a national obsession. People couldn't get enough of them. It was the depression, so everyone was angry at the government, everyone was angry at the banks. And so even though these, these were criminals, these were hoodlums, they took on this sort of Robin Hood aura and they became subject of a lot of legends and myths. And so I was intrigued by that. I'd read a good amount of histories of the real you know, bank robbers, Dillinger and Bonnie and Clyde. And of course, we've all seen you know, movies. We've seen things the that are based on The Road to Perdition. The Road to Perdition, which is a favorite of mine. I love that yeah, movie. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, it's funny, my brother just sent me the, the new edition Blu-ray so I can catch it up is on good, that. Isn't it's, it? it's a great yeah, film. Yeah. Um, just the iconography, the fedoras and the trench coats and the Tommy guns and the fast cars. The rain, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that, that's, but that's all like, that's the style and, and the, the fast talking. You think about movies like The Maltese Falcon and The Big Sleep. You know, it's where hard-boiled fiction got its start in the 20s and 30s with writers like Dashiell Hammett. Um, but what I was struck by reading those histories was that I mean, this is the Great Depression. This is a major event. Millions of Americans were out of, job, out of work. They were tossed out of their homes. They were starving. But all of the movies and novels I could think about that were about bank robbers, they barely touch on that. Um, if you see Bonnie and Clyde, I mean, yeah, they look kind of poor. But for the most part, there's very little address very little addresses the Great Depression. There's this one scene where they've been shot up and they drive by um, you know, a little like squatter's colony and they ask them for, for water because somebody's been shot. And, but apart from that 22nd scene, that's it. Um, Public Enemies, which was, I thought, a pretty good movie, the Johnny Depp movie that yeah, came out. Yeah. It actually came out about six months before my book came out. Um, it was a great movie. Um, and again, he got the visuals down perfectly. But Hardly anything is about the depression. Um, very early in the movie, after he's robbed a bank, there's a scene where you know he wakes up. He's hidden his gang in some woman's abandoned farmhouse just to hide from the cops, and you know they have breakfast. They thank her. They walk away, and the woman says, "Take me with you." And he says, "Sister, I can't." And then you, they they sort of focus on her for a few seconds to see the despair of the depression, and then that's it. And the rest of the movie is Johnny Depp looking fabulous in his purple pinstripe yeah. suit. No, no Hoovervilles. Yeah. yeah, they, yeah. So. And, and I, understand the po I understand why that happens. You've got this glitz and glamour of these larger-than-life criminals. The depression is depressing. People don't want to think about that sort of thing. But part of what motivated me in writing the book is I wanted to really delve into the issue of you know, financial problems and what happens to a family when they're out of work, when the dad is out of work, when the business goes under, when you're going to lose your home. You know, those sort of interpersonal dynamics. What happens to the, the parents' relationship with their kids? What happens to the relationships between the kids? Um, these can be heavy and depressing things to write about. So in a way, having this kind of razzle-dazzle plot with these bank robbers was almost the spoonful of sugar that would enable me to write about that. Because I tried to write about those issues before, and it hadn't worked. It was too heavy, it was too dark, yeah, it was too yeah. depressing. So I thought the combination could be really interesting. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have guessed that for some reason. Uh, I love I love an interview where I, where I learn something. I usually right. anticipate most of the most of the answers. So I was going to ask you why you, you you chose. So you chose the plot as a vehicle to reveal the reality of the depression in many ways. Kind of. I don't know if it was that yeah, calculated, yeah. but partly. I don't want to put words in Sure. But and, and the thing to bear in mind, you mentioned the book came out in 2010. It was early 2010. I'd pretty much finished the book in late 2008. So let's You're, disabuse the audience who thinks that this was a critique of. Uh, of of current economics and yeah. Yeah, 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 and that's a really interesting thing for me is that I'm sure people reading it now are going to think that it's some kind of a commentary on our current time, that, you know, the Great Recession and what we're going through now, and that's perfectly valid. If this book speaks to people in a more personal way because they're going through things similar, I mean, there's there's nothing wrong with the way anyone wants to interpret a book. It's all valid. It's just surprising to me because as a writer, to a certain extent, you think you can anticipate what people might think, but you're always shocked. So I pretty much finished the book in 2008 when my family and I actually relocated to Georgia. We moved to Decatur and we were unpacking our boxes in September of 2008 when NPR was talking about how Lehman Brothers had just gone down, yeah, which yeah. started this major financial crash. And suddenly, things like this were really happening. So I hadn't anticipated that at all, but it does you know, add new shadings to the book. In my research for this interview, Thomas, there were a number of critics that said, um, this guy is really talented based upon your first book, and you won, you won some prizes, it's required reading in some thick, some freshman colleges, I, th yeah. I think, something like that. And uh, of all the topics the writer can choose, why would he chose, why would he choose something as, some, some territory that's been mined as heavily as it has? Mm -hmm. And what's your response to that? Uh, you may, you, t you touched on it in your last answer, but mm -hmm. I need to hear it again. Sure, why did I pick, choose this why book Why did you then? pick, the, yeah, yeah. I will say one of the, probably the hardest thing about being a writer is deciding what to write next. Yeah. I have a lot of ideas, yeah. but when you finish a book and when you think, okay, what do I do next? You know, what, maybe you have 10 ideas, but what's the idea that you want to spend the next two or three years of your life on? That's a pretty big decision. Yeah, yeah. And so when, when The Last on Earth had come out, I mean, it was a crazy time. I'd finally gotten a book deal. I, you know, my next book was going to be published in a few months. 
Uh, my wife and I were expecting our first child, lots of changes yeah, going yeah. on, and I'm trying to juggle these different book ideas. I started maybe two or three different ideas. I would try something out, it wouldn't work, I'd put it down, try something else. I was kind of pinwheeling between these three ideas, and one of them was something about bank robbers during the Depression. For, for the reasons I mentioned before, sure, I wanted to write sure, about yeah, financial yeah. hardship, I thought it was fun. One of the troubles sometimes with literary fiction is just finding a good story to tell. Um, you know, sometimes literary novelists are wonderful writers, they have poetic language, but the story isn't always there. And I knew with this territory there was a lot of plot possibilities. But as you mentioned, it's been done. And that was a problem I came to the first couple times I wrote sure. it. Yep. I tried to start it with a bank robbery scene and it was cliched and it was boring and it was like every bank robbery scene we've ever seen in a movie or a TV show. I tried writing a scene about the brothers growing up in their dad's shop and it just felt kind of boring. Um, and then I was thinking one day about all these stories and myths that spread around the real bank robbers. I mean, what they did in real life was amazing enough, but that only led to even crazier stories that, that John Dillinger could rob multiple banks in multiple states on the same day, that um, John Dillinger actually wasn't killed, that, that the FBI shot the wrong man, which is a rumor that started because his, um, after they killed him, they brought in his sister to identify the corpse. But by then he'd had plastic surgery and he'd also yeah, dyed his yeah. hair. And she said, that's not Johnny. And some reporters heard that, they ran to the phones, called their editors, and you know, FBI shoots wrong man. J. Edgar Hoover brought her in the next day, showed her some moles and, and you know, birthmarks, and she said, yes, that's him. But at that point, the stories were out, and people were talking about John Dillinger sightings you know, all over the country. So there are all these crazy, crazy stories. And you know, as, a, as a novelist, as a fiction writer, as somebody who likes to make stuff up, you know, I reflect a lot on the differences between fiction and truth and history. And I thought to myself, you know, a lot of people these days like to say that truth is stranger than fiction. And as a novelist, I kind of take that as a personal challenge. I want to write fiction that's stranger than truth. So I wanted to take those myths about John Dillinger being the thief no jail can hold or being the man who could do anything and take it to the next level. And I thought, what if I wrote about two bank robbers who death itself can't hold? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I tell the audience that, how the book sure. opens up? Mm -hmm. They wake up after a bank robbery. They wake up after they've been shot. Mm -hmm. They wake up after they have died. Uh, that's, Pretty that's, much. That's, as, that's as far as I'm going to go. Sure. And it, that's, that got me from the very beginning of the book and stayed with me till the very end. I don't want to talk too much about the plot because it's, the audience needs the pleasure of turning the pages as I did. The, the ending was magnificent. Um, let me go at it this way. Um, the book is about two bank robbers the Fireson brothers called the Firefly brothers. They're, they're almost mythic in their exploits. There's a gun mall Darcy. There's a, Mar Darcy's father is a evil automobile magnate. Mm -hmm. There are Hoovervilles, which we'll, we'll explain that. And they seem to get away with a lot of things and they're unable to die, but they die, which is, that conceit is so beautiful. A lot of critics, have had trouble trying, critics tend to say this is a book of historical fiction, it's magic realism, noir. Um, you have a wonderful blog, and Thanks. I want the audience to be aware of that. Uh, just go to Thomas, if you go to Google, type in Thomas Mullen, you'll find your, your, the thomasmullen.com uh, Th website. Thomasmullen.net, there's it's, another one, unfortunately. Okay, okay, but yours is the better yeah. one. <laughs> um, where you address a lot of these issues, but how do you respond to people who say, like, um, is this book historical fiction, uh, noir fiction, or what? You're the writer. It's, yeah, gosh, it's a big question. There's a lot of possible different answers. Yeah, well, I'll, yeah, yeah. I'll say it's two different things. Um, when it comes to historical fiction, I don't think of historical fiction as a genre. It's a setting. Calling historical good, good. fiction a genre is like calling second-person fiction a genre or, or right, first-person right. fiction a genre or you know, anything set in New York or genre. I mean, it's, it just happens to be set in 1930. If, I, if Philip Roth writes a book that's set in 1970, is that historical fiction or is that regular fiction because he was alive then? If I write something set in 1970, is that historical because I was only a kid then? You know, it just gets kind of complicated. I think there are different types of, of historical fiction where some people are reading it more to learn about history and they want it jam-packed with facts. I tend not to read those sorts of books. I just want you know an interesting story, well told, and whether it's set in you know contemporary Atlanta or in 1930s Ohio or wherever, that's what matters to me. So, because you know two of my three books are set in the past, I get historical fiction a lot, but I don't really, I don't mind. Um, I don't. Some people I think don't like historical fiction and they think of it as sort of a genre, but 
not I'm, I'm not bothered by that. The other question about it's a great book. <laughs> thank you. But the questions about you know noir, yeah, um, yeah. magical realism. Yeah. But my my new book, Revisionist, has a little bit of sci-fi and espionage yeah. in it. Z comes in from the future. Yeah. yeah, yeah Again, yeah. I I just want to tell an interesting story, and I try not to trouble myself too much with that. It might. It would probably be easier for my publisher to market my books and maybe easier to pigeonhole what kind of a writer I am if I always did the same thing. But you know, a lot of my favorite writers have written things that might have a mystery in one book and might be a romance in the next and might be futuristic the next. Um, I try not to hold myself back in that sense. And sometimes I think it's fun to take a genre where there's certain tropes, you know, a bank robber story, we kind of know certain things are probably going to happen at certain points, but to upend expectations in different ways and tinker with it. I think that sometimes artists can be even more creative when you put yourself in a box. Say, okay, this is going to be a mystery. Something happened. There's a crime in the beginning that has to be solved. What am I going to do to make that more interesting? Whereas if you just tell a broader story that doesn't have any of those constraints, it's counterintuitive, but because you have so many options, you almost are yeah. less creative. I'm just thinking to myself right now, Thomas, about some of the cinematic scenes in the novel. There, there's, reminds me, you know, this movie is called Heat with yeah. uh, Val Kilmer. And he and um, Al Pacino, no, uh, Robert De Niro, are yeah. walking down this highway with machine guns and the cops are all that. You have a scene where the, the Firefly brothers are fleeing uh, a bank robbery and they're in their car pursued by four or five police cars. And it's like, it, for about three or four pages, it was unbelievable. I mean, it, it's, I want the audience to just... Thanks. Yikes, it was good writing. Well, you've um, got to have a car chase. You've got to have a car chase. Over. But... <clears throat> Here's, it's a, this is an issue that's been not bothering me, but I, I think I've thought of, I've been thinking about this for years and years. It was James Thickey who once told me that um, how can we believe a novel when it's nothing in it is true? It's a pack of lies. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not verisimilitude where the author tries to give you an impression of the truth. You're writing a historical novel. It's everything is made up, and yet the details have to be correct. You have a, I mentioned this before the interview, you have a, um, an Essex terraplane. They can't go 80 miles an hour because you have one of them going 80 miles an hour in the book. I went on the internet and said, oh yeah, they can go 80 miles an hour. The sub Thompson submachine gun fires so many rounds per minute. You, you know that. Uh, you know that. Uh, I don't remember it anymore, but I'm okay, glad okay. I seem to uh, How much research there. did you do? Because um, you, didn't, you didn't make any mistakes. One, one more example. There's a bank robbery, and so you've got the federal agents involved. Mm -hmm. And you can tell I'm getting excited because the book really got to me. So one newspaper telex is another. I said, there can't be telexes in 1934. Wikipedia, telex invented 1932. Boom. Well, if it was on Wikipedia, it must be right, right? <laughs> I, no, um, no, no, no. You got me there. I probably did less research than you think I did. Seriously. But um, I, I'm not, you know, camped out at a library going through yeah, the microfiche. Yeah, yeah. But I, I read a lot of books. You talk about I, the books you know, that I, you read. I'm not a historian. I'm yeah, a novelist. Yeah. So I, I will read other people's historians. I, I profit off of historians' labor. I'll let them write the history book well, and I'll put, read that. Well um, you know, I wasn't going through old diaries, that sort of thing. But I did read a lot, and you know, whether it was just reading about you know, basic histories of the Great Depression, or maybe more specific things about Ohio, or I'm trying to remember, but you know, different yeah, yeah. things to, to fill in gaps in knowledge. And you know, I would have a notebook with me at all times. So if I read something about some interesting reference to a car or clothing, things like that were the hardest for me to remember and get down. You know, clothing, cars, uh, weapons. Yeah, so yeah. any any reference I would see in history to this sort of gun, that kind of hat, I would jot it down and remember so that I could insert it into the fiction later. Sometimes when I'd be writing the book. I'd deliberately leave certain facts out, or I'd just type three X's so I could do a final replace later, because I'd know, okay, I need a detail here, I don't have it. And again, I don't like novels that sort of drown you in the detail, because there's a fine line between creating the world and showing off, yeah, yeah. and if a fact doesn't have a reason for being there, it shouldn't be there. Otherwise, it, it, it ruins this. I'm casting a spell, I want to make this seem real, yeah. but if there's too many details, you start to hear the author saying, oh, and here's another cool thing, and here's another cool thing, and it ruins the spell. So there were some interesting facts and figures that I had in early drafts of the book that I wound up cutting out, because I realized, ah, no, this doesn't really need to be here, I'm just proud of myself for having discovered it. You didn't use a lot of 1930s gangster slang, which is famous. Remember, remember that movie, uh, Miller's Crossing? Yeah. Every other word is like, hey, what's the rumpus? Or don't yep. give me the high hat. It. Or he's, a, he's an artist with a Thompson. You know, you don't do that. I mean, you, some. You, you mentioned the word gat. I like, I like that. He's, I'm not packing my gat, you know. But um, was this a conscious effort on your part to, where did you, how do you recreate language that you've never heard? 
That you get mostly from reading old okay. novels okay. or seeing old movies. And even there, too, you know, they're novels and they're movies, so yeah. maybe people didn't really talk that way, so it's a little bit risky. Um, but, yeah, to get things like dialogue, you can't necessarily rely on history books. Sometimes I'll mention slang here and there. But I do think there's a fair amount of that stuff. But, yeah, Miller's Crossing is extremely stylized. I love the Coen brothers, and I love that movie. I've probably seen it ten times. But I think they really wanted to hit you in and the head forgive me for comparing your excellent That's book fine. to movies. Okay. Oh, no, I, I, I'm a huge movie fan, and I, I love the Coens. Um, I, probably, I might have less slang than they do, but I've got some. But sometimes certain slang we now equate with certain movies. So some yeah, of the stuff yeah. that they use in that movie is legit. I've, I've later seen it in Dashiell Hammett novels from the 1930s and things like that. Like, oh, that's where the Coens got it. But I was afraid if I used it, people were going to just think of the Coen Brothers movie instead of 1934. So in a way, I couldn't use some of the legitimate slang because it would just feel wrong to people. I want to segue away from the novel for a minute and just mm -hmm. talk about you because I've, sure. uh, I've, I've got you here, Thomas. Okay. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, born and raised in Rhode Island, mm -hmm. Barrington, Rhode Island, yep. um, Oberlin College in Ohio. When did you start seriously consider, considering writing serious literature? Uh, as, as long as I can remember. Seriously. I wanted to be a writer, yeah. So I wasn't writing serious literature yeah, when I was younger. Yeah. I was writing, you know, Hardy Boy knockoffs when I was in grade school, and writing, you know, detective knockoffs when I was in college. Um, but yeah, I've, I've always wanted to write, and when I got out of school, that was, you know, one of my main objectives. You know, I, I had to pay for a roof over my head and have a real job. But at night and on the weekends, I was working on novels. Did you go to any of these famous creative writing courses? Uh... I, I, I didn't. Um, you know, I honestly, I graduated college with a lot of debt and the idea of going to get a master's degree in something like creative writing. Oberlin's expensive. I yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it was a great college and I don't regret it, but right. I do think I'm in the minority among writers my generation in that I don't have a master's in fine arts degree. Yeah, I yeah. think a lot of people do that. And, you know, I, I can't criticize it because I haven't done it, but I think you need to be in a certain financial situation to be willing to take another 50 grand out of the bank to get a degree in something that's not really going to help you get a job. So, and, and I always wondered, should I get an MFA? Is this a mistake? And up until the day I got my book deal, I wondered if I should have. But then I got the book deal and I felt like I'd kind of gamed the system. I'm just plumbing my memory right now, but but, but your, your first novel, mm -hmm. uh, The Last Town on Earth, is set in the Pacific Northwest, 1918. It's about a town that tries to quarantine itself from the, um, the pandemic of flu. Mm -hmm. uh, your second novel, the one we're talking about, The Many Deaths of the Firefly, Firefly Brothers, is set in 1934 about two gangsters who refuse to stay dead. Okay. Um, your third novel, uh, which I have right here, The Revisionist, is about someone named Zed who comes in from the future to protect the Earth from an imminent catastrophe. Which I know sounds ridiculous, this but is, it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> right. I mean, if I were your agent, I'd say, what are you doing? No, no. Yeah. What, the, how does your agent feel about this? I think she she <laughs> likes my books, and so that's the most important yeah, yeah. thing. But no, as I said before, it can make it hard for the marketplace to know where you go yeah. and, and that sort of thing. Um, you know, I sort of stumbled upon historical fiction. I mentioned trying to write as soon as I got out of college. The sorts of things I was writing then were all contemporary about people my own age, you know, living in modern America. Some of my favorite writers were people like David Foster Wallace and Dave Eggers. Oh God, yeah. and lots of slang, long sentences yeah, yeah. and commas and hyphens and swears, and that's what I was writing. But it wasn't working out. Publishers weren't knocking my door down. Um, I wrote a book that was good enough to get me an agent, but we weren't able to get it published. And so once every last publisher said no to it, she, you know, my agent said to me, okay, well, I still believe in you. I still want you to, I, I want to represent you, but you need another book. You know, and I, I didn't have another book in my back pocket, but she asked me what were my ideas. And you know, again, talking about always having, you know, 10 ideas. And one of them, you know, most of them were contemporary, but one of them was this story I'd heard about the 1918 flu. And she said, go do that one. And, you know, I'd had the idea for The Last Town on Earth for years, but I, I had always thought that would be, you know, my mature third novel. Because a lot of my favorite writers, you know, Michael Chabon, Barbara Kingsolver, yeah, they would write two or three yeah. contemporary novels, and then their third or fourth book, they would wow the critics with a historical epic. I didn't think you could just kind of come out of the gates as a young writer and write a historical novel. But my agent said, you know, why not? Do it. And I think that shot in the arm, you know, the, the fact that she figured, why not give it a shot? Combined with the fact that I'd come so close to getting my last book published, I think I channeled my depression at not getting the last one published. And I said, yeah, I'm going to go write this. I'm going to do it. And, you know, it worked. So I've kind of jumped between genres and, sure. and settings. But I'm going to try to get a question out of, a, uh, out of an observation. I recently okay. um, hosted a, a, a literary event with Jeffrey Deaver who has written 29 novels in as many years. And he loves to say, I am not an artist. 
I am a businessman who happens to write. I'm a tradesperson who knows his craft. He spends three, four months out of the year figuring out what the American public or the, the Anglophile phone wor world wants. Then he'll spend six months writing, then some revision, he hands it to his agent and makes a million dollars a year or something like that. Um, how do you see that? How do you see yourself as juxtaposed to someone who says, I, I write for money, I just, it's a trade? Because obviously, this is lit. People will be reading your stuff a hundred years from now. I, Thanks. I, 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 I hope firm, so. I, fir I firmly believe that. Do you, do you see yourself as an artist? I mean, it as sounds, as it dumb, sounds as pretentious, as but yeah, I, I see myself yeah. more as that than, than no, as a businessman. It's not, it's not if I was a businessman, I'd be making more money. Okay, maybe that's what that's what I'm looking for because the the work you do in the in these novels, Thomas, is is remarkable, and you're living right here in Georgia. What's the what What are you working on now? Um, I'm, I don't what, are you, talk, what are you doing in Georgia? Yeah. No, no I'm, I'm, I'm not going to talk about my next book because my agent's in the process of pitching okay. it. But um, it's set in 1945. So it's, it's again, it's historical. I just sort of accidentally keep stumbling on these little like nuggets, yeah, these yeah. half-truths that really intrigue me, and they're usually set in the past. But. I want to segue right back into the novel, The Many Deaths of the Firefly Brothers. I'm just plumbing my memory right now, having read the book. You're very non-judgmental about your characters. Did, mm -hmm. did you do that? You, did you do this consciously? Yeah, one of the- These are bad guys, sure. but, that, but I love them. That was one of the things I wanted to play with, because again, you know, I mentioned people embraced Dillinger and Bonnie and Clyde as, as these Robin Hoods, but these were criminals. They did rob banks, they did kill people. And Dillinger was really smart. He was, he was a part you know, bank robber, part PR agent. He realized the appeal that he had. And at one point, you know, he was in a bank, and this has been repeated in several movies. Um, it was in Public Enemies, too. He goes into a bank, and, and I, I think I rip him off in the book, too. Yeah. There's a couple of points in the book where I deliberately yeah. rip off the real people. But um, he's, so he's announced we're here to rob the bank, and he sees you know, a farmer who's just brought his money into deposit and all the money he's made of the year. And he sees the man trying to like, hide his cash, and Dillinger says, oh, don't worry, sir, we're not after your money, just the banks. Exactly, and people, exactly. people ate that up, and they loved it. But when you think about it, it makes no sense. If he robs from the bank and the bank goes under, everyone course, in town who's deposited there has lost their money. But people bought into it, so much so that Clyde, um, uh, Bonnie and Clyde, Clyde who was really yeah. a bloodthirsty killer, and who was nothing at all like I mean, what Warren Beatty presented him as. I mean, that was a great movie. It was a groundbreaking film. But you know, Brian Burroughs and his history, Public Enemies, sort of exposes Bonnie and Clyde were evil people. They yeah. robbed from yeah. small um, mom and pop drug stores. They killed people for no reason. But Clyde heard that line from Dillinger, and he saw how it went over, and he used it a couple times too. So I wanted to kind of play with that. In, in the book, we hear from different people. We hear from their third brother, who's home trying to support the family legitimately, and he resents them. We hear from... To be, Thomas, sure. to be continued. Okay. We're just getting into the heart of the interview right now. It's been 30 minutes. I, oh, ladies wow. and gentlemen, The Many Deaths of the Firefly, Firefly Brothers by Thomas Mullen, one of the best books I've read in a long time. It's literary fiction, historical fiction. As Oscar Wilde would said, it's, who cares? It's just so well written, you've got to go out and buy this book. Find it at your local library, your local bookstore. George's own Thomas Mullen. Thanks for being here. Thank you. God, I'm sorry to cut you off like that. That's but, right. Um, that just flew by. Like a that was, wow. Comments and opinions expressed on Writers in Focus are those of the individual participants and are presented for the purpose of discussion only. No endorsements by Atlanta Fulton Public Library System or Fulton County Government are intended and none should be presumed.